Welcome to Quality of Life Radio, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Sarah Elliston is back on Big Blend Radio today to share tips on how parents can retain more influence through active listening and learn how to not be a a boring parent. Nancy, are you a boring parent? Not anymore. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Sarah is the author of the book, Lessons from a Difficult Person, How to Deal with People Like Us. You can get it on Amazon or on her website. Go to sarahelliston.com. Sarah is also a faculty member of the William Glasser Institute. She's a workshop leader and trainer who is certified in values, realization, parent effectiveness training, and reality therapy. Again, her website is sarahellison.com. You can also read her Big Blend Radio and TV magazine articles. If you go to blendradioandtv.com, you'll see Sarah featured in our expert department. And uh, actually, she's got a brand new article right there just on this, Active Listening, How Not to Be a Boring Parent. Sarah, welcome back. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking. How are you? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing good. We're looking forward to learning how not to be a boring parent. But um, (laughs) this is interesting, I think, because active listening, you know, reading your article, which we'll discuss now, and everybody, again, it's up on blendradioandtv.com. This is something for everyone to learn and to, to utilize, even in the office or around friends. Yes. When I used to uh, teach it to parents, they would go and practice it at work, the active oh. listening approach, because they felt less threatened there. Um, and they would try to listen to some of their colleagues or customers. And, of course, they found that <laughs> they had better relationships at work. Because um, mm-hmm. when they when you when you respond to your children differently than you've been responding, it can feel a little scary at first, a little mm-hmm. threatening. So <laughs> that's what I found. But yes, this is a this is a uh, I don't want to call it a technique, but I guess that's right. A skill, a way mm-hmm. of being with another person that can be very very helpful, especially when they're um, emotional, when 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 something is not going well for them. That, see, I think that's the thing is you, yeah, when someone's not doing well, you always, there's that tendency to start telling them how to get what through to it. Do. Yeah, that's what yeah. to do. And that, and it's, that's a, that's a, it, that's a normal reaction. I mean, that's just someone trying to be helpful, but it may not be for the person who's feeling upset about something. I know when I was first learning this, um, the distinction was pointed out to me that a lot of men will feel like when their wives are talking about a problem, they start suggesting all the solutions because that's mm-hmm. the way the culture is focused. You have a problem, you you solve it. You you find solutions for it. And you know, I have I've had bosses who said, "Don't bring me the problem without the solution." And and I thought, well, that that's not very <laughs> that that means I've <laughs> got to go work with someone else to to brainstorm some solutions. But that's the way they wanted it. But a woman is is more apt to be, uh, especially raising children, is more apt to be just wanting to talk, just wanting mm. to hear her thoughts and and hear kind of come to a conclusion themselves. I think everybody really prefers that. Um, I, I think our culture kind of divides us in that way. And it certainly was true that I, uh, as I was first studying this um, parent effectiveness training, I would say to my husband, do not solve my problem. I'm just telling you how I'm feeling and telling you about the problem, but don't tell me how to solve it, okay? <laughs> I had to kind of learn to say that, and he'd say, oh, okay, but his reaction was, and why are we talking about it? <laughs> but, but you know, he, he began to understand also. But it's just, mm. it's just a different way of um, approaching uh, an issue, that's all. And I, I truly believe it is a very respectful way of approaching an issue, because it allows the person who is emoting or angering or feeling whatever they're feeling or needing to talk about, it allows them the uh, res- the opportunity to just talk about it without having to um, explain it to other people any more than what they're just saying. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And And without having to guard against solutions. Now, why didn't you do this? Or now, when I came home from school and said I got into trouble with the teacher, my mom would say, "What did you do?" 
I think a lot of people now, the kids come home and say they got into trouble. The, t the parent says, well, what did they do? You know, there, there's sort of a, now that's mm. getting into school things, but um, it wasn't, I, uh, maybe that wasn't a very good example, but when when I said, you know, I'm in trouble, I didn't do, get my homework finished, my mom assumed that the, 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 the school was doing the right thing, and so I had made a mistake. And even if I hadn't made a mistake, maybe it had been somebody else's fault, it was too bad. Mm. <laughs> I was the one that was going to have to solve it. But <clears throat> she would at least listen. You know, she wouldn't say, well, you know, you should have done this, or you should have done that. Um, yeah. And that's what I think, that's what I think active listening is trying to to get a, get away from that you ought to have done this or you should have done that and and let someone actually kind of think it through themselves and come up with their own solution isn't that kind of like a how therapy or a coach will work with somebody you know not in this, you know yeah well coaches, coaches have emerged yeah the mm -hmm. coaches have sort of evolved in the last as i've watched it we had uh we did parent effectiveness training and and people uh, got a lot of support in the classes, and they used, to, they used to say, we would meet for eight weeks. That's a heck of a commitment. And then they'd say, oh, we want to meet for another month. And I did it once or twice, but it just, what they mm -hmm. really wanted was they wanted the group support. They wanted the place to sort of talk about what was going on in their lives, like a little therapy group. And um, at that time, you could go to a, a psychiatrist. And then 10 or 15 years later, they had the whole evolution of counseling, and they eventually got licensed and had some hoops to jump through in order to, to be professional. And so we evolved into having coaches who can take classes to be certified, but really they are doing a lot of active listening as well as you know goal setting and strategic planning with people. I think they call it something else, but that's what I see them doing. Mm -hmm. But they all start with the basic premise is that the person, whoever it is, knows what they're feeling and they'll tell us if we get it wrong they they'll also they have the resolution already they just don't know what it is mm. and that's that's the respect i'm talking about that 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 whoever whoever it is that you're listening to in this case children they really do have a solution mm. uh it may not be the one that you like but if we give them the chance to feel their way through it um and respect their ability to be responsible for their feelings and we also can be respectful of their solution, as long as it's not that, breaking the law or something. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think that when when kids are upset, they need some time to calm down, and they most of them are going to talk while they're calming down. And so, you know, they they can be a little bit all over the place with what they're saying until they finally get to where they're calm, and then they start to make some sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. when they can start listening to themselves and say, oh, well, well, maybe I do know how to solve this. Yeah, I think um, the, the, the challenge is parent effectiveness was actually developed for parents of 13, 14, 15-year-olds, you know, early adolescents, mm -hmm. because um, these, these kids would be having problems. They'd, they'd come to see the counselor. The counselor would work with them for three to four months, kids getting back on track. And you know, six months later, the, the the parents come in and said, "Hey, Doc, you got to fix my kid again. Something's wrong." And after he'd done it for I don't know a year or two, he began to realize that it wasn't the kids at all; it was the parents. And because when when they're eleven, twelve, thirteen, that's when the parents start to get a little. Now, make sure you do this, and don't you do that, and you better not, and 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 start seeing them as uh, logical. The kids start acting as if they're logical adults in terms of arguing with their parents, but the parents mm -hmm. don't see them as um, someone to listen to. They they see they they feel a lot of parents will feel that their role is to lay down the law and make sure that this kid does everything right and 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 not get into drugs or or you know early sexual behavior and things that are going to maybe um, hurt them in the long run. Uh, and so this, I think active listening to a seven, eight, nine-year-old is very different than listening to an 11, 12, 13-year-old, unless you did it when they were seven, eight, and nine. Okay. And then build Does them into it. Does it make sense? 
Yeah, yeah. and and with this, so when you're you're just kind of like getting them to tell you more and more, it's kind of like what we do on radio shows. It's like, oh, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. And especially well, when you actually, know there's something juicy on the other side, you, you want to get to that with, <laughs> and let them bring it up, not me go, now I heard you had an affair with someone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but you let them come up with it themselves. It's, it's, and it's, to me, this is such an important thing, especially for teenagers, because they're learning decision making and uh, how to become responsible through this. Yes, and the, and the most important thing for a parent at that point is to have a strong relationship because no matter how good at it you are, your 13-year-old is going to be 13. I used to turn to my son and say, the year he turned 13, I used to say, that, I can remember saying this to him more than once, I understand that you're feeling, you know, adversarial right now and you want to argue with me, but could, could just for the next 10 minutes, could we pretend that you're still 12? Could we just be 12 for a little bit, just to give me a little peace? And then we can get back to the 13-year-old. Because it was, it was almost chemical. You can almost see the, the change as, as it evolved into his birthday. And uh, luckily, we had a strong enough relationship that I could say that, and he would laugh. And, and whatever hostility was going and whatever argument was going on, that, that defused it some. But that's because I started active listening to him when he was three, which is a little inappropriate, actually. Um, mm. But and, and just to define what active listening really yeah. is, is uh, it, it's listening to the feelings behind the words and stating the feelings. So you're feeling, I mean, the, the stock phrase is, so you're feeling this, so you're feeling mm. that. Um, mm. I think a lot of people in our culture say, well, how does that make you feel? Um, and I don't like to ask people that because I don't think anything makes us feel. We, we choose our feelings, but a lot of times it's a subconscious choice. So mm. I, I prefer the statement, so you're feeling this, or, yeah, that sounds like it would, wouldn't feel good. Um, okay. So and let's, let's, I was going to say, let's, let's take an example. So, um, Sarah, I'm going to come home from school and mm -hmm. I got in trouble <laughs> because I, what did I do? Let me pick, well, a, pick one of the you, many things. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't do my homework, but I really have been working on it. And, um, and so I got in trouble. I messed up for some reason, but I was still really working on something cool with it. So I come and tell, okay, I'm really upset because now I am having to go to detention and they put my name all over the school that I didn't do my homework when it's not quite true. And I'm very upset about this. Yeah, I kind of feel embarrassed. Yes, <laughs> I feel embarrassed. Yeah, and it sort of feels like it wasn't fair. Well, part of it is and part of it isn't. Ooh, see, now you start taking ownership. Wow. Well, that was kind of quick, but we're both adults, so. <laughs> I know. I'm just like, suddenly I was like, no, man, it's right back in your, you Maybe, put the ball right back in my court. Well, you know. Well, I'm just, I, I'm just identifying what you're feeling. That's all I'm doing. So, so, um, a quick, a, like a quick, um, dialogue that part of it's in my, um, in my article. So the a little person comes in and says, somebody, um. Uh, so, so the, the, the child comes home and says, everybody's against me. I don't want to ever go to school again. And the parents yeah. say, well, it sounds like you don't feel very loved. You feel alone. Yeah. So you're feeling sad. Yeah. How come people are so mean? Boy, that's a tough question. You're feeling hurt. Well, I thought Maggie was my friend, but today she threw clay at me. And, and the little child cries. And you feel hurt, embarrassed, and confused. I hear you. Mm. And the child said, well, it was mean of her. She's never been mean before. Why did she do it? So so the, the rather than the mother saying, gee, that's really different. It sounds like it was unusual behavior for her. I wonder what's going on for her, which feels like a logical thing to say, you know, mm -hmm. as a parent to sort of let's explore what her motivation was because the child got there. And the mother was just saying, boy, it sounds like you're you're in a tough place here. And and you're embarrassed, and you're confused, and it hurts, and and then I I it just goes on and on. But <laughs> hmm. it's just this is 
um, the child says, do you think Maggie is scared or sad? And her mom says, well, I don't know. Well, she says she hates her new baby sister because she cries all the time. Maybe she's tired. Oh, new baby makes everybody tired for sure. Well, maybe that's it. Maggie's usually fun. Maybe, maybe I should tell her not to be scared or sad or tired or something like that. Um, so it goes all the way from this woman was mean to me to, oh, or this child, this friend was mean to me. Oh, it's mm. because she has a new baby sister. And I know that as an adult, when you are thinking in terms of how much time do I have with this kid, right? To say, gosh, what has anything changed in Maggie's life? You know, what do you think? Do you think she's, is she like this all the time? And and we're asking the, the child to, to think about it, which she does eventually when you allow her to feel her feelings first. Mm. And, this, the, and, and yet you can still have a good conversation by asking those questions if it's a young person, like seven, eight, nine. Um, but when you ask someone a question, you're asking them to think. And when you make a statement, uh, Sounds like you're hmm. feeling sad. Sounds like that hurt your feelings. Um, that is n not, they don't have to think, they just go, uh-huh or uh-uh, that's not what I'm feeling. I'm feeling this. But it is more, it's a more affirming uh, behavior and they hear it as support and they don't have to think. They can stay in whatever their feelings are and explore them some more. And what Dr. Gordon discovered was that if we can listen, especially developing that listening relationship, then when you mm -hmm. get to the point where they're 14 and you say, was that against the rules? <laughs> were, you, were you supposed to be doing that? Um, you still have a, a decent relationship and they're not just gonna go, oh, whatever. Oh, they may yeah. say whatever, but you can continue the conversation. Yeah, because if eventually if, if you always know your parents or you know, as a kid, it, you're going to get caught out, you know, with whatever you did wrong, you're not going to go there, you know what I mean? And then that, that can build a bit of a wall, you know, it's like, if you know that you can talk to your parents and really be yourself, then things will come out. And I think the kid will take responsibility, you know, for their actions eventually, because eventually they're just going to say it themselves. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I used to bust myself all the time. I always wondered how come Nancy knew what I did because you talk. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, that doesn't, that's not changed. You know, and eventually you just catch yourself and it's like, oopsie. Well, you know, there's, you know, the kids come in different um, sizes, you know, in uh -huh. personalities and Lisa just always talked, hmm. you know, and she'd tell me everything. Yep. I never had to ask. Now, me my too. parents, yeah, my parents were like, uh, what'd you do at school today? And every single one of us said nothing. All of the kids, six kids in a row, nothing, 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 nothing. Well, for a reason, <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah, well, it's the way, it was the way we were questioned because the tone was already, you're going to get in trouble, no matter what the uh -huh. answer was. So the safest was nothing. Yeah, <laughs> oh, wow. well, the thing, um, the thing about the active listening process and, and system is it, you you really it doesn't take longer it's what that's the irony is that uh if you listen um the fewer questions that you ask uh the more people talk and they do resolve their issues or they get to a point where they say i'd really like to know what you think um you know what what would you have done maybe but i know from my own experience that there were times that i thought oh my god i <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to do X, Y, and Z before I go to bed, and here he is wanting to talk, and, and, and how much time can I give this? But if I just stopped and listened and really listened to what he was saying mm -hmm. and the feelings underneath it, it, it was fairly speedy. It was, you know, it wasn't a long, it wasn't like a therapy session or something. It was just a, a conversation where he resolved it himself. But I really had mm -hmm. to um, believe that he had the answers and that I didn't have to have one and some and it is kind of nice it, it takes us off the hook of having to solve their problems but it does put us on the hook if you will to really listen to what they're saying and I think a lot of us get so busy mm -hmm. especially if we're, we have two parent families and they're both working um, 
mm. or even with a single parent, you know, it, the, the, you come home with the work and it takes a while to decompress the work, you know, let go of that. And um, sometimes it can be all encompassing and the mm. day goes by and whoops, I forgot to check in with yeah. the young person, you know. What what happens if you have, you know, a, you know, two kids, you know, and mm. maybe they're both upset with each other. So-and-so stole the Barbie and did something <laughs> to the Barbie head. And, you know, you know how the, the sibling stuff happens mm -hmm. sure. and they're both upset and screaming at each other. Can you use active listening with both of them at the same time? It depends on the situation, of course. I mean, if you need to separate them and listen to one for a while and then go listen to the other and then bring them together um, for peacemaking, that's certainly one option. But also, if you can say, okay, this is Jane's turn to talk now and she's going to talk about how she's feeling. Okay, thank you, Jane. Now, Tom, it's your turn or Mary or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. so let's, let's see if we can, if we can work this out. But again, um, you would be saying, gosh, it sounds like, um, Jane was really upset when you took her doll and, uh, hmm. really hurt her feelings. It felt like you didn't respect her and you, you were just teasing her and being mean to her and what all the things that she says, whatever. And then the, then the brother might say something like you know she's she always gets all the attention and that in which case you you listen hard to that of like so you're feeling left out you feel you don't get as much um attention or time or whatever that you want you know and 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 then turn and say to mary do you think that i see i don't know um whether you could depend on the kids and their relationship mm -hmm. is a, how does how do you feel yeah. about what she's feeling? How do you feel about what he's feeling? My hunch is that if you can listen to them, um, and when you're starting this thing, it it feels like it. Oh my God, how do I do this? But really, you can weave it into your conversation all the time, mm. <laughs> so That's that by the time you're talking to your children, it's mm. it becomes a habit. So you're standing in the grocery store line and. Well, how are you doing today? And you say, great. How's your day going? And she says something and you say, sounds like it's a good day for you or sounds like you're feeling happy here today. Or you, know, you can weave the, the process into every conversation you've ever had. Of course, you might get someone who'll talk your ear off, but you know, uh, that was supposed I to be think a it's a good. I think it's a good <laughs> building block for parents, you know, and I think, I think it's, it's also, important. it's important as well if it's um you know, there's a divorce and split homes happen and it's a way to get those those conversations out into the open and not under the rug. Um when a child feels confused and it's you know, then you know, one parent starts buying the child everything in the world. Um or the other parents like, okay, you know, because then it becomes who's who's the the biggest disciplinarian and all of that when it's really the most important thing is to listen and let the child know that you're attentive and that you care. I mean, listening means caring, period. I mean, it really it does. does. And, and I think it's tempting in our culture for the parents to start competing with the children for attention mm -hmm. and affection. And I don't know, there's just competition is, is everywhere. And so if, if, if we as parents say, my job here is to listen to this kid, and support them and respect them and help them identify what they're feeling because sometimes they mm -hmm. don't know and and the, the beauty of it is is if you say if you say it if you say the wrong thing it's like oh it sounds like you're feeling hurt i'm not hurt i'm furious oh so you're really angry yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> um mm -hmm. and yeah i'm angry blah 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 and and the, the thing is that the statement invites further conversation and then you have another feeling that you can identify mm. and as, I, I, as, I, I just ahead. want to be the kid who goes no yes <laughs> that's <laughs> I, the three-year-old I know I just feel like I'm well, sorry that's I, the just, thing. <laughs> I just feel <laughs> like that I, I feel like they're the, no <laughs> you know that, that definitely is three-year-old mine <laughs> I know the mind. I know. I just automatically go into that mode. It's like it's even just you know going. Oh, I got in trouble for my homework. I already, I already was like, 
way, you know, it becomes that. But this is this is really something very effective, and and I think it is effective for adults. And I just I like it because kids do get to actually formulate instead of just being upset and throwing slamming their door, because then it's just it's emotional, but no true thought process of of what is wrong or what can I do differently, let them come up with that. I I think responsibility is important for kids. Well, it's good to have everything out in the open for sure. Mm -hmm. So you know what's going on with your child. And as they grow up, you get to know who they are Mm -hmm. and how they're likely to respond to different things. And this is when you've got that one eye open for, uh, this is not how Lisa normally behaves, something's up. And mm-hmm. if, but if you're never listening or watching, then you miss all those signs, and then later on some big problem may occur. So yeah. it's good to have that listening, open ear, open eye kind of bead present. Mm. Yeah. The, the the temptation is to then lecture. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, when, when you sure. when you you're doing this and you're hearing all the things and everything's out on the table, then the temptation is to say, well, here's what, here's what you need to do, or here's the best way to handle this. That's really hard. I think it's just hard for people not to do that. But I was Mm going to say, I'll say one more thing about active listening. I I first took the class when my son was like three years old. I had, I had read the book because I didn't want to spank him. Mm -hmm. And so here I am with a three-year-old sitting on the floor (laughs) in the grocery store, negotiating whatever oh, it was boy. he wanted to buy and say, so you're really feeling hurt that I won't buy this. So I heard, yeah, yeah, you're pretty angry about this. You think like you deserve it. And <laughs> where do you go with that with a three-year-old? You know, <laughs> so so I, I thought about it later. I just, someone said, well, you have to think about their um, uh, age, uh, mm-hmm. whatever the word is, <laughs> what was age appropriate. So you really, you can listen to them and identify their feelings for them, but you're going to do it anyway. You're still going to have to get in the cart and go back home. Um, but mm. but by the time they're five, six, seven, then you really can hear the feelings. Um, but <laughs> you have to well, do it. What is it about the grocery store? There's oh. something about the grocery store and sitting Stimulation. down and crying on the grocery store. And, throw, and throwing things in the cart, <laughs> the cart thing. Yeah, it's dangerous. Well, I just... I think about it now. Well, this is a smaller grocery store in a more rural area, but I I did that more than once. And I thought, I'm being such a, such a caring parent. And then um, the more I taught it, you know, the better I got. And I I taught it at a Montessori school often. And the Montessori teacher would come in and she would talk about age appropriate um, Mm. activities and, and, you know, (laughs) You can listen. You can active listen a three-year-old, but at some point, it's still going to be your way <laughs> mm, <that's, laughs> because they don't they don't have the capacity yet to to tell you what they want to do instead. They want to just do what they want to do. Eventually, though, with through active listening, would would the child turn around and ask ask for advice if they need advice on something, especially when they're older, especially when so, boys yeah. and girls start meeting each other? And here we go, and girls and Girls and girls in the high school yard. I know about that. So here comes the drama. So you know, yeah. you know, and all the well, emotions and the body changes and oh boy. So I think um, any adult uh, interacting with young people, so teachers, counselors, coaches. Uh, I I coached. Uh, they were like a uh, like a drill team. And they did it to music. I think there was a name for it, and I can't remember what they called it. But I did that for two years back when I was teaching high school. And I never saw these girls any other time except the two afternoons a week they would come in my classroom and practice their drills and stuff. And I was surprised at how, uh, what a relationship we developed because I wasn't marching with them. I didn't know anything about it. They knew what they wanted to do. They just needed a faculty advisor. So I was that. Mm -hmm. But because I would just listen to them and not tell them what to do, um, in terms of their relationship, uh, really, we built some strong bonds there. It was fascinating. So these, this, this particular skill can be very helpful for anybody working with young people. But as I say, um, it, it works mm. with it works with everyone. My mother used to say, "Oh, are you doing that thing to me? Are you <laughs> are you doing that listening to me?" I'd say, "Wow, you really you kind of feel put on the spot there, Mom, huh? You think I'm making you a guinea pig?" <laughs> so, and 
then she's like, you're doing it, aren't you? <laughs> I can see what's going to happen to Nancy and I now. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's going to happen. We're going to be going around. Oh, you're doing that Sarah thing. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing parent effectiveness. Yeah. Well, you guys already have a good relationship, so it doesn't, it doesn't match for you at all. You probably well, no, we, we, have our, we have our moments of pushing each other's buttons. We yeah, know we them do. very well. And then it's like, are you pushing my button? Do you know that I have a new button? Yes, I, I do. Say, don't push that button. I'm not in the mood for that one today. No, yeah. no. Please yeah. take the one on the left. You're in the, you're in the age of reason. You can negotiate that. Yeah. So I used yeah. to say to my son all the time when he got past that 13-year-old, it's more like 16 and 17, I'd say, are you, are you doing that on purpose? Did you Ooh. know it was going to really make me mad? Or, or did you forget that I really don't like that language or that you slammed the door? The one that I hated was, when we moved into a condo and the, the mail comes, there was a slot in the door <laughs> and I would come home and he'd been home for hours and the mail was still on the floor. And I just, just for whatever reason, it really annoyed me. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's, it's, well, that's, that's a, that's a guy thing. I think it's like, come on, if something's you? happened, pick it up or, you know, that's a, that's a guy thing. You know, I oh, we have a okay. friend, and her and her sons <laughs> crack me up. Her one son, it was Thanksgiving goes, I was going to have my, my, um, his, his Thanksgiving cocktail. He's, he's, in, he knows how to push mommy's buttons just for fun. Uh -huh. I was going to put it in the cranberry can, uh, the oh. cranberry stuff can. Like yeah. he was, I'm going to, I was going to drink, drink, it, drink out. it out of there just to see what you would do. And she just looks at him. He goes, I know what she would do. <laughs> so I didn't do it. <laughs> she also got mad when they decided that uh, the, the house was for riding bicycles across it, you know, funny. on the inside. She was like, that's not yeah. happening. That's not happening. But <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, boys are a whole other deal and girls are definitely a whole other bag of, of tricks. And um, wow. Well, wow. It's pushing limits. Wow. Well, we to know. find out. Yeah. Is, is there going to be a boundary or not? Yeah. And I'm going to push tall. Yeah. The parents say, okay, now here comes the boundary. Yeah. There it is. Right. Yeah. When they want the boundaries. They definitely want boundaries. Yeah, because no boundaries kind you, of You says, don't know where you're at. Well, it also says I don't care. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's totally true. You know, yeah. so you need the you need the boundaries. It's how you institute yeah. the well. boundaries. Here's the boundaries. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, always a wonderful conversation with you. Very insightful, helpful for parents for sure, and for any of us, so. you know, out there yeah. learning how to, you know, communicate better. Um, everyone, again, Sarah's article about active listening is up on blendradioandtv.com. You just go to the expert department or just type in Sarah, you'll find her. And also go to her website, sarahelliston.com, and get her book, Lessons from a Difficult Person How to Deal with People Like Us. You listen. <laughs> That's what happened. That's the boundary. <laughs> um, again, on One Amazon, way. all those great stores. But of course, we're going to play music for you. Uh, we have a, a good song pairing today. It's called I Hear You. <laughs> it's from the Tall Men group, who we love. The, the, the six tall men, they have a songwriting challenge every month. And they get together. And then once a year, they record their songs. And uh, they're all just incredible seasoned uh, veterans in the world of songwriting and singing and songwriting. And um, But I Hear You is the song. And uh, everybody, it's off of the album Too Tall, the second album from the Tall Man Group. And you can get their albums on CD Baby. Thanks so much, Sarah. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Take Thank care. I look forward to talking to you again. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. you bouncing off satellites tonight Imagine you're here lying next to me Your numbers become the combination to my life Unlocking the signal I so need To hear you Out of billions of voices Daily war is over 
in this battle I've yet won. I need to hear your words to comfort me. So I fall back into my room and watch the setting sun. Pick up my phone and dial from memory to hear you. 